Hi, I'm Corey Franklin, and this is Obituary Podcast. Usually I'm with Carolyn Gilbert, who's in North Texas, but Carolyn is on holiday for the Christmas, New Year's holidays, so I'm flying solo again today. We're going to start out talking about Blake Edwards today, great movie director. Edwards died recently. He was married to Julie Andrews. He started out in television, created Peter Gunn, and then went on to movie. One of my favorite Blake Edwards movies is an early one, Experiment in Terror, starring a young Ross Martin, Lee Remick, and Glenn Ford, set in San Francisco. Uh, catch it sometimes. It's a good one. Uh, after that, he went on to direct the movies he's best known for. One of the first was The Days of Wine and Roses, also starring Lee Remick with a great theme song. Lee Remick and Jack Lemmon are codependent alcoholics in the movie, and uh, it's the best codependent alcoholic movie since Ray Milan and Lost Weekend. Uh, it's a tragic movie with some great performances and, as I said, a great theme song. I'm going to play a little bit of it here for you by Julie London. You may know it by... Andy Williams, but Julie London did it, just a terrific version of it. The days of wine and roses laugh and run away like a child at play through the meadow Through the closing door, a dark night, that wasn't there before. Just a passing breeze Filled with memories Of the golden smile That introduced me to The days of wine and roses Jack Lemmon cried the first time he heard that song. Right around the same time, Blake Edwards did one of his masterpieces, Breakfast at Tiffany's, from a story by Truman Capote, starring Audrey Hepburn as Holly Golightly, with the great theme song by Henry Mancini. Speaking of Andy Williams, here he is. Blake Edwards used Henry Mancini music in a lot of his movies, and it sure was good. Someday you dream maker, you heartbreaker. Wherever you're going, I'm going your way. A little later in his career, Blake Edwards did Ten, a movie that brought Dudley Moore to American audiences and made a star out of Bo Derrick with the background music being Bolero. Also starred his wife, Julie Andrews. Here's a little bit of 10. She was the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. Even though he doesn't know who she is. Sir. This man who crossed the hottest sands, climbed the highest mountains, and sailed the deepest seas to make his dream come true. Because on a scale from one to 10, he's about to meet a 10. Oh, Derek should have kept making movies with Blake Edwards instead of going with her husband. She ruined her career after that. Of course, Blake Edwards' biggest success, uh, what he's most well known for, the Pink Panther movies. Again, great music by Henry Mancini. the um, Pink Panther movies is, of course, Peter Sellers. And Peter Sellers drove Blake Edwards crazy. I mean, at one point, he refused to work with him anymore on one of the uh, sequels. 
And uh, he had his agent ask for an incredible amount of money, figured they'd turn him down. They didn't turn him down because the movie's made so much money. <laughs> Blake Edwards had to make another movie with him. But Peter Sellers, who was a funny guy but an absolutely insane man, drove him absolutely nuts. Here's a little bit of dialogue from one of the Pink Panther movies, including one of the oldest jokes in the book. It's not my dog. My name is Professor Guy Gadbois, medieval council authority for Marseille. Tell me, do you have a ring? I do not know what a ring is. Zimmer. Does your dog bad? No. Oh. I thought you said your dad did not bite. That is not my dog. Grown there. Another guy he drove crazy in the movies was Herbert Lam, who was his police supervisor. Idiot! How was I to know he was the bank manager? How were you to know the bank was being robbed? That is correct. What is correct? I did not know the bank was being robbed because I was engaged in my sworn duty as a police officer. You didn't even arrest the old beggar. There was some question as to whether the beggar or his minky was breaking the law. Minky? What? You said minky. That is correct, yes. Chimpanzee minky. So I let them both off with a warning. The beggar was the lookout man for the gang. That is impossible. Why? He was blind. How can a blind man be a lookout? How can an idiot be a policeman? Answer me that! It's very simple. All he has to do is enlist. Shut! How do you know he was blind? Because he told me so. Oh, he told you so. And you believed him? I have no reason to doubt him. <laughs> do you believe me if I tell you that I'm not going to get you suspended for six months? Do you believe me? If you say so, sir, yes. <laughs> because I'm a bigger liar than the beggar. You are suspended for six months without pay. Six months? Effective immediately. Have you anything to say? Could you lend me 50 francs? So that was Blake Edwards. Uh, my favorite Blake Edwards story in closing is uh, before he met Julie Andrews, someone asked him at a party what was the reason for her phenomenal success when she was in Sound of Music and everything like that. And Blake Edwards quipped, well, she has lilacs for pubic hair. Julie Andrews heard about that and sent him a, uh, a lilac bush. And they started dating, and they wound up married for 41 years. So we say goodbye to Blake Edwards, who was a great director and a pretty funny guy in his own right. For all you avant-garde rock and rollers out there, Captain Beefheart, a.k.a. Don Van Vallette, died. Uh, I'm not a big Captain Beefheart guy, but uh, he played with uh, Frank Zappa a lot. He influenced a lot of the punk and post-punk. Lester Bangs, the rock critic, thought he was a genius. Matt Groening loved him. Um... I had a hippie friend once who wore a Captain Beefheart t-shirt all over the place. And Captain Beefheart was uh, a strange dude who produced strange music. And we'll take a little listen to some of it. Yeah, that was Moonlight on Vermont. Here's another one. There's old gray with her dove wing hat. There's old green with her sewing machine. Where's the bobbin hat? Toting old grain in a printed sack. The dust blows forward and the dust blows back. Yeah, I think a little Captain Beefheart goes a long way. Anyway, there was an interesting tribute to him in the Telegraph of London after he died. They really liked him in England, go figure. Uh, this is from the Telegraph of London. Dan Van Vallette, a.k.a. Captain Beefheart, could be a difficult man. His idiosyncratic recordings, a bizarre goulash of Delta blues, free jazz, jobberwocky-style surrealism, and Dada-esque humor, were an acquired taste never likely to find a popular audience. Boy, that's for sure. He was notoriously dictatorial with a manipulative, domineering personality once described as Manson-esque. He claimed to have studied brainwashing techniques before recording his epical 1969 album Trout Mask Replica, the better to discipline his group, the Magic Band, to his baffling time signatures and enigmatic directives. The drummer, John Frumbo French, described the atmosphere preparing for the album as cult-like and told of Beefheart attacking him with a sharpened broomstick and then throwing him down some stairs after he'd failed to rise sufficiently to the command to play a strawberry on the drums. He claimed credit for everything was a notoriously stingy paymaster, but he could be surprisingly genial. 
The author met him once in 1980 in a budget hotel in Bayswater where he and the Magic Band were staying. Seated in a breakfast room populated by businessmen and tourists, he cut an incongruous figure, a heavy-set man with a luxuriant walrus mustache carrying a green plastic bag with a clothes peg clipped to his shirt. He'd recently cut off his hair to show my ears, he explained, but he feared that he now looked like a taxi cab going down the street with both doors open. It was one of the most surreal conversations I'd ever had, ambling in a haphazard fashion through his views on Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, his affection for poultry, his disdain for rock music in general. He said, it's disgusting. Plants just absolutely do all they can to get out of their pots when they hear rock music, and Bob Dylan in particular. He said the times they are changing. He was a quick change artist, if you ask me, although he did get the last breath of Woody Guthrie on a mirror. Beefheart expressed bewilderment anyone would listen to his music. I don't know how people can stand it. Who would want to be beat, slapped, have their wood pulled off if, if they have one for sure? I can't stand falsies. When I was three or four, I found one of my grandmother's falsies, and it had no nipple. It was a hip shape, and that old foam like a soya bean steering wheel. His voice rose in a deafening bellow, blow your top, blow your top, causing everybody in the room to cast anxious looks in our direction. His father, he said, had been a helmsman. On a boat, I asked. He said, similar. He sold goods door-to-door for Helms Bakery. He never claimed to have been to school, not even kindergarten. He was a child prodigy, he said, driven by a passion for art so all-consuming, his parents were obliged to force food on him while he painted and sculpted. As befits a man who wore a raw carp on his head for the cover of his most celebrated album, and whose herb included such songs as Pachuco Cadaver, Bat Chain Puller, and Making Love to a Vampire with a Monkey on My Knee, Beefheart was an artist who stayed heroically true to his peculiar vision. The only time he allowed himself to be persuaded to bend his music to popular taste with the album unconditionally guaranteed, he suggested repentantly that purchasers should take copies back for a refund. Having decided to abandon performing in the mid-80s, he went on to make more money from his paintings, brash expression as Dobbs, as singular and challenging as his albums than he ever made from his music. An artist is one who kids himself the most gracefully, he told me, and I may get hardening of the arteries, but I'll never get hardening of the eyes or the heart. I refuse to have my heart attack me. We're friends. Well, that was Captain Beefheart, and I guess we're going to miss him, although I won't miss his music too much. Finally, a small tribute to Steve Landisberg, the comedian who died recently, was best known for being Dietrich on the, in the 1970s cop show Barney Miller. Landisberg was a comedian, very funny guy. Here's a brief bit of surrealistic dialogue between him and Jack Sue, who was another detective, as Dietrich ponders a walk in the police station. Funny guy. Huh? It's called a walk. It's used to cook Chinese vegetables. Oh. No offense. I'm not Chinese. Well, you were once, uh, around about 4th or 5th century. I'll be 46 in April. <laughs> I don't see you. Happy birthday. Barney Miller was a great show, and Steve Landisberg was a very funny guy. Well, there you have it. Blake Edwards, Captain Beefheart, and Steve Landisberg. Little humor and a lot of surrealism. They entertained us for 50 years, and we'll miss them. So until next week, that's all, folks.